Good morning, everyone, or afternoon, depending on where you're coming in from. My name is Mark Purcell. I'm the interim CEO at Unison. I'd like to welcome you to the 2024 Unison Virtual Summit. The last summit we held was in 2022, which was also virtual. And I'm so happy to see so many familiar faces here today, as well as a lot of new faces, which is great. <clears throat> this year's summit will feature 40 speakers across 24 sessions. Our concurrent sessions are comprised of three different tracks. The first track is Artificial Intelligence and the Future of Teaching and Learning. Uh, this was by far our most popular track based on proposals. And I don't think you can have a conference in this day and age without <clears throat> talking about artificial intelligence, regardless of what discipline, discipline you come from. The second track is called Data in Action, where you'll start to see examples of how different units and members are using data, specifically teaching and learning data, to support application development, IT integration, and different kinds of institutional research efforts. And our third track is called Being Student-Centered, where you'll start to see examples of how different units and members implement uh, education technology solutions, as well as examples that come from faculty development on how we're working with faculty across the consortium. I wanna thank all our presenters. Events like this are made possible through your willingness to share and generosity of your time. So thank you very much, we appreciate it. For those that may be not familiar with Unison, just a very quick high-level overview. Unison's a nonprofit consortium with a mission to accelerate student success initiatives through data and accessibility. We do this through a combination of products and services that include Unison Engage. This is a courseware delivery platform that follows what is known in our industry as an inclusive access model. Engage launched in 2017, and uh, we hit a milestone last fall where we've saved in aggregate $100 million in student savings and courseware purchases. So very proud of that. Our other major product is called the Unison Data Platform. Throughout the day, you will likely hear people in sessions using the acronym UDP, uh, and that's what that stands for, the Unison Data Platform. So that's a platform that harmonizes data from a student information system, a learning management system, and a growing number of education technology tools. Uh, the data platforms used to power learning analytic ap analytics application development, institutional research, IT integrations, uh, many, many different things. I always like to say that there's no wrong way to UDP. The glue that holds all of this together are our 10 communities of practice where personnel from our members come together to share best practices and collaborate on various projects. For example, you can learn more about Unison's faculty development community of practice and their collaborative work at 1215 Central Time on Thursday, as members of that community talk about Stepping Stones. This is a faculty development curriculum focused on learning analytics that members of our community created and are now updating with content to support faculty in the use of artificial intelligence. Please don't hesitate to reach out to me throughout the two days of the summit, uh, as I'll be in a lot of the virtual rooms. Unison staff will also be here that you can reach out to, uh, as well as our presenters. We like to think we're a very approachable bunch and always happy to talk about Unison. I would also like to give a big thank you to our sponsors. Uh, without our great sponsors, putting on an event like this would be very challenging and nearly impossible to, to do an event like this that's entirely free for the higher education community. I want to specifically thank Instructure, our platinum sponsor, for their continued support of the Unison Summit. Instructure was Unison's first vendor partner way back in 2015, and we continue to collaborate uh, and are highly aligned with Instructure around our efforts on how data can be better used to support student success uh, across our consortium as well as beyond. So at 1.15 p.m. Thursday, Ryan Lufkin, Vice President of Global Academic Strategy at Instructure, will talk about the generative AI revolution, an update on Instructure's AI projects and approach. Uh, I saw a sneak peek of some of this work last week, and I think people will be really impressed of all the interesting things Instructure has planned. I also want to thank Kaltura. As part of Kaltura's sponsorship, we're leveraging their recently released event platform. The Kaltura team's been great to work with, and we're excited for their session later today called The Next Step Digital Experience Toward a Personalized Campus for All. That'll be 315 Central this afternoon. And for those that may not recognize Denodo, this is a data virtualization platform that some of our members use to bring together teaching and learning data with all the other data that resides at our institutions, as well as manage access to those different slices of data. Uh, they have a session at 2.15 Central on Thursday called Switching Cloud Providers, Changing Courses and Making the Grade. Uh, this will be given by Dan Young. He's the Chief Data Architect and Manager at Indiana University, where he'll articulate how Denodo played a key role uh, in successfully migrating cloud vendors at IU. 
Many of our members leverage Turnitin, and we thank them for sponsoring the summit. Uh, you have the opportunity to engage with representatives from Turnitin during our sponsored speed dating session. That's today at 115 Central, as well as representatives from Kaltura and Denodo that'll be more than happy to talk more about the different products and services they have. I also want to give a big thank you to Yunus and staff and our friends at Kaltura for helping to pull this off, uh, particularly Noah Spencer, Milan Bird, and Glenda Genscher, and especially to Mariah Aguilar, who without her, we certainly wouldn't be here today and have all of our ducks in a row to have a great uh, two-day event here with the Unison Summit. So shifting gears to Kyle Bowen, who will be kicking off our keynote this morning. A little bit about Kyle. He's the deputy CIO at Arizona State University, where he's responsible for enabling how the ASU community experiences technology to learn, work, and thrive. A self-described storyteller, Kyle is passionate about the transforming education with a learner and student-centered approach. He was previously the Director of Innovation for Teaching and Learning with Technology at Penn State University. By collaborating across the institution, he advanced faculty professional development, space design, learner creativity, and data science efforts. Kyle also formerly served as the Director of Learning Informatics at Purdue University, a role that shaped the university's strategy to improve student attainment through award-winning emerging technologies. Kyle's an entrepreneur, teacher, and regular speaker on innovations in higher education. Co-author and editor of more than 20 books on design, development, and usability. His past work has appeared in the New York Times, USA Today, and the Chronicle of Higher Education. I had the opportunity to work with Kyle for several years at Penn State, and we both share a passion for innovation and education technology, but we also, over the years, discovered we shared some other passions outside the office. I recall on a Friday afternoon in February, where it gets pretty cold here in central Pennsylvania in February, walking into Kyle's office and just chatting with him about, you know, what we had on deck for the weekend. And I mentioned I was planning to make chili for my family. Uh, and Kyle got this really big grin on his face. And, and the next 20 minutes was Kyle sharing with me his lessons learned and experimenting with different types of chili recipes, where uh, at the end of the conversation, he indicated he's on a constant quest for the perfect chili recipe. So rewind two months, here I am in central Pennsylvania still, uh, putting together a batch of chili and, you know, it reminded me of my conversation with Kyle. So I shot Kyle a text, said, hey, you know, I'm a, I have a batch of chili going. Here's the recipe I'm using uh, and very quickly got the response. Hey, that looks amazing. Fast forward about, you know, two or three hours. Good chili takes time to come together. So right before I about to ready to take it off the stove, I send him another message, say, hey, you know, about ready to eat. Uh, and he quickly responds, who puts corn in their chili? Apparently in Arizona, this is a no-no, right? I know Texas has their thing with beans. Maybe Arizona has a thing, thing with corn there. So I thought that was very comical. And I'd like to share a, a personal anecdote here. And if we have time at the end of Kyle's session, maybe we can ask if he's finally found that perfect chili recipe and if artificial intelligence had any part in finally realizing chili perfection. So with that said, Kyle, I will hand over the stage to you. Oh, wow. Terrific, Bart. That That is awesome. Yeah, I mean, for sure, you know, moving uh, to Arizona, my... Uh, Chili game's been stepped up a little bit with uh, with access to chilies. Um, you give me a second while I, I transition over uh, to sharing my uh, presentation, and uh, and we'll kind of get get rolling here. So anyway, yes, yeah, thank you very much for that for that introduction. This is a, a really meaningful opportunity to kind of speak with this group today as, as a former kind of member of the Unison community. Um, you know, and, and, and kind of part of I've attendee of this conference in the past, you know, sending my kind of virtual hugs and high fives to the friends that I have here today that really looking forward to uh, this conversation. You know, and, and all of us are kind of exploring, you know, artificial intelligence, AI, how, you know, in a lot, in a range of different ways. And I think it's important for us to kind of talk about what our strategies are, because there's no kind of one right way, uh, but rather there are lots of different activities unfolding. And so it's important to learn and, and, and kind of see how others are approaching it. So for Arizona State University, I mean, we center and drive a lot of our work based on the charter. Now, I have a colleague who says that if we don't share the charter, we lose our parking pass. I don't know if that's true, but, but I'm not going to risk it. Uh, but for anyone who works at ASU, if you ask them, you know, what part of the charter resonates to them, you know, they'll, they'll be able to, to cite it for you. And for me, it is this phrase here, which is how we measure ourselves by not who we exclude, but who we include and how they succeed. And that, that says so much about our AI strategy. Now, our AI strategy is really one that looks at, you know, change across the institution. 
And it comes in a lot of different shapes. Now, we're used to change that happens from the bottom up. We're used to change that happens from the top down. Now we have a technology that, that cuts across disciplines, that, that influences so many different parts of how we do research and, and teach and work. Uh, and so part of it is, is to embrace that this is a change that happens across a range of different spaces. So as Bart mentioned, you know, I like to, you know, present and talk in terms of stories. And, and one of these is that I, you know, ask you to kind of participate with me is to, you know, many of us work in technology fields and we work in places of change and we're used to kind of working with technology that helps, helps kind of create that sense of change. But I want you to reflect back for a moment, kind of go back in time, maybe it's to the 80s or the 90s or the 2000s. Maybe if you're older, you have to go back further. That's okay. But think about, you know, telling the people of that era about today's technology, right? And how they would react to something like that. And I think about, you know, when I was in my middle school math class, and I used to tell my math teachers, like, why do I need to learn this stuff? I got a calculator, right? I don't need to learn it. And she would always say, well, it's not like you'll have a calculator everywhere you go. Well, about that. I do have a calculator everywhere that I go, right? That there will be a day where that's a common thing. That in fact, there will be a day where, you know, I won't talk on my telephone, but I will stare at it for hours on end. That there will come a day where I'll even hop into cars with strangers and pay for the opportunity to do it. That there'll be a day that just for fun, I would strap a computer onto my face, right? That these are evolutions of technology that would have been hard to predict or, or just seemed outrageous previously, but now are, are part of our reality. And part of this is that we work in a profession that is deeply uh, steeped in tradition, right? This painting from 14th century Europe depicts what the artist describes as the university classroom. There's something kind of oddly familiar about it, particularly when you kind of look at this guy taking a nap down here or these two folks in the back row kind of checking their, their Instagram DMs or whatever it is they were doing in that day, right? That this is part of what we think about in terms of the higher education experience. That students, we want them to come in with the expectation to be blown away, but then are sometimes met with what can be a harsh reality that what we're seeing is this change in terms of how people are motivated in their in their learning and we have to kind of begin to ch challenge long held beliefs like Maslow's hierarchy of needs that now must be updated to you know before learning can happen we must start with wifi and power and it's not hard to imagine a day where ai becomes a part of this hierarchy of needs because our students have an unprecedented set of options in terms of the technologies they use to support their own learning. That it's not unreasonable that a student would bring multiple internet connected devices with them. Right now, what we're seeing is if we look at traffic across our local networks, we're seeing tens of thousands of users engaging with uh, with tools like uh, ChatGPT on a regular basis. And this is where students have kind of self-selected these tools and brought them to their learning which means that part of what we have to do is kind of reshape the pathways that we provide to our students through their learning process. Not putting in systems that kind of create a new way to hide things, but rather you know, create greater flexibility so that students can kind of find their own path uh, through the institution and achieve their successful outcome, whatever that outcome uh, may look like for them. And so part of this is what I like to describe as a one size fits one experience. So thinking about the technologies, the tools, the processes, the things we can put in place that helps a big experience feel small, that helps a student recognize that their, their experience is personalized for them, that it can be what they want to make of it, that it reflects where they want to go and what their intended outcomes are. And that's the big opportunity for us. And, and this is where AI has a role, that it begins to put in place those, those, those ideas, those, those capabilities, where our students can begin to kind of shape and mold their experience. Now, in the near term, there's going to be, you know, ways of doing that where they, you know, within courses, begin to think about their coursework differently. But over a longer period of time, this is where students begin to create and, and construct their experiences, find their own pathways, which is why it's so important for us to invest in these technologies now. That historically, we've thought about, you know, learning as kind of a, the one successful outcome, but realizing that there's actually a entire spectrum of experiences that students have through practice, through failure, through trying, 
right? That it's the totality of this experience and not just the outcome, which is so critical. And that's where using, again, technology, we can help think about what is, you know, what are those stages of a student's experience more so than than just kind of the earning of, of, of an assessment, but rather how did they get there and helping them align, helping guide a student in terms of aligning the, that trying that failure with where they want to go, with what their career aspiration is or the impact uh, that they want to make on society. Part of this is also taking and applying what we know and understand about the science of learning, right? That we can take these tool, this thinking and begin to apply it uh, to these new technologies. So with that, I want to change gears a little bit and talk a little bit about how we're exploring AI here at Arizona State University. And I really want to kind of discuss this in terms of what our AI, uh, ASU AI enterprise strategy looks like. And it has these kind of four pieces to it. And again, the intent here is to kind of talk about how we've thought about this and what some of these drivers are, but realizing this is a quickly evolving technology. And so part of it is just to be agile and to continue to pursue these um, in a lot of different ways. So with this, I'm going to kind of think about, you know, what is the culture, the community? And this is really a key part. It's where we've started. It's where we've spent, you know, more than the last year kind of working and developing, thinking about what is the technology infrastructure. Again, a lot of different ways to approach that. Some of the transformative partnerships we've developed. And then lastly, I'm going to spend a good chunk of this presentation talking about and sharing practical examples of students and faculty kind of innovating around their pedagogy. And that's why I'm so excited about like the session that comes up next, because this is where all the terrific work is happening right now. People thinking creatively about how to engage their students and help and, and make them a part of this kind of transformation process. So all of this is, is a part of what we describe as an impact-driven approach. And really it, the focus here is on what are the positive outcomes for our fa students, faculty, staff that, that AI can help enable. What we're wanting to approach uh, to avoid is kind of two things. One is the spreading of AI like like peanut butter across the institution, right? Really, what we're where is the activity? Where are the big ideas? Where are the places we can invest where those outcomes can happen? And so that, that for that us that requires widespread experimentation. The other aspect of, of this impact-driven approach is to begin to demystify AI. We don't want it to be a kind of mystical secret sauce that gets applied, but rather it's something that, that our faculty, staff, students can think critically about as they kind of engage in this active transformation. We've established a set of guiding tenets as an institution, really kind of rooting our work and saying, okay, these are the places where we want to have our impact. And so as we think about kind of the impact we're having, you know, where are the, what, what is it, how does it relate not only to our charter, but in terms of what these tenants are, in terms of looking at the future, being responsible, supporting creativity and the responsibility of our community, and really at the end of the day, thinking about this from in terms of digital equity. How do we provide tools, technologies to our students to help them succeed? So like I said, the first big area of this is around our culture and community. And, and, and we've been working on this for well more than a year, uh, you know, engaging with a range of different groups. And part of this was to kind of engage our community around under, you know, thinking about what are the different places where impact can take place with AI? Where are the kind of big ideas at? And this is, this is what a lot of those look like. And that began to inform, okay, where is it that we want to start to kind of invest? Um, and what are the tools and technologies that we're gonna need in order to make that happen? A big part of that was bringing together a range of different groups and to explore um, you know, the promise, the potential, the, pot the potential uh, challenges and issues, right? The technology, uh, the applications, right? So to, to begin to explore a lot of these different um, structural pieces so that we could help inform our community, help them make uh, kind of the right uh, best choices along the way. But this also started as a kind of first step towards formalizing a lot of the community structures we have uh, today. So one of the one of the big areas uh, that that's been uh, cultivated through this is our community of practice with our faculty who convene, they get together, they discuss, they're, they're hosted by different units and departments. But these are faculty who are at the forefront of working with the technology, they're experimenting with it. They're seeing, you know, where are the places where it can have impact? What are the challenges and concerns that they're running up against? And this is a big part of kind of generating excitement inside of our community and, and really kind of engaging in that creative process. 
Another big part of this has been around education. That, that from the get-go, it was important for us, again, like I said, to demystify uh, the technology and really help people not only become aware of how it works, but really think about its practical applications. So one of the things we developed was an online course for our faculty around AI literacy that has these kind of key areas. And it's designed so that a faculty member kind of inserts or, or joins the course at whatever point uh, makes sense for them. And we've seen thousands of faculty with no incentive uh, engage in this uh, course, which is remarkable. I mean, anybody who's worked in uh, training and professional development knows if you can get, you know, 25 or 30 people to come to a course, you're doing pretty good. So for us to have, you know, thousands of faculty engaging in, in this, in this uh, exploration with us, is remarkable, and it really demonstrated kind of the excitement, the 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 um, the interest at, at kind of the that kind of bottom up grassroots level for people to want to be a part of kind of defining uh, this change with us. Now, along the way, we've also kind of created a couple of different you know structures, community structures. I'm going to touch on two of them. One is around our our fa faculty ethics group, uh, which advises on AI matters. And one of the things you'll notice about this group is the diversity in their backgrounds. So these aren't necessarily are all technologists, but rather they come from education, they come from law, they come from the arts, they come from uh, you know futures thinking and business, right? So they come from a range of different disciplines and backgrounds, and they are an active part of the technology design process. So it's not a situation where they're kind of brought in at the end to say, okay, let's evaluate the ethics of what we're doing here, but rather so that it's designed into the process. And it's a critical part, we feel like, of kind of building out uh, this AI strategy. The other action we took was to, to assemble a group of innovators, creatives from across the industry, uh, that, that are coming together to help inform how we are kind of thinking about, you know, the trajectory of this work, that it's it's kind of aligned with where we want to go, that, that we're scanning the, the landscape and thinking about, you know, what's happening out there, other ways of thinking that. And so part of that is to bring perspectives from outside the institution and bring them in. So that's where, where we've kind of had this, again, a kind of diverse collection of voices from entrepreneurship, from community programs, from, um, from, from technology, right? Thinking creatively with us about, you know, what that, you know, future of AI can look like for ASU. So looking ahead, you know, a big part of this is around technology, right? And really thinking about kind of what is the future focused technology that we want to kind of focus, we want to begin to build on. And a lot of this is infrastructure, right? Because this is stuff that hasn't historically kind of been a part of our environment, but there are elements that we are building on that are so critical, right? And part of that is, you know, long um, uh, investments in kind of data management, and data, data strategy. And so the better our data environment is, that's where the more it can help inform uh, what our kind of technology capabilities look like today. So as we develop new AI technologies, it's largely driven by principled innovation. And so this is something where we didn't just adopt this as part of our AI work. This is our principled innovation framework is something that ASU has just adopted across all of its all of its projects. And really what it does is it helps us kind of ground this, uh, our work, in terms of the, the moral, civic, performance, and intellectual implications of that work. And there's certainly, a, I mean, we could talk for a long time about principled innovation, but part of it is, is so that as we're kind of engaging these pro projects, that we have a common framework to think about kind of what is a principled way of approaching uh, this technology. We've also, like I mentioned before, we've kind of established this ethics group. We've also constructed an evaluation framework so that as we innovate, we have a way to evaluate the outcomes, you know, some of the changes we're seeing. And the last is kind of engaging with our broader research uh, teams to, to think about, you know, what the structure of that could look like. We've also simultaneously within our, our enterprise technology organization constructed what we call an AI acceleration team. We have brought together a team of data scientists, ML ops engineers, software engineers, right? we brought them together to focus on this kind of activity. So how can they help drive us forward, not only in the short term, but what is the long term implications of some of what we're able to do? And the key here is, so far has been to focus on kind of two big areas. One is in building enterprise platform and the other has been in developing key products.
So this is a, a very high level chart. And actually, this is what we share with a lot of our leaders inside the institutions to help understand that there's kind of these two big areas, right? One is around our, our, our platform, our AI platform that we develop. And what this does is it allows us to begin to blend our institutional data with uh, generative AI capability, but to do it in a safe and responsible way. And so that's where, again, where, you know, because we're talking with the Unison member here, and that's part of where the, the Unison data platform becomes kind of like that staging ground for those kinds of AI integrations, right? And so that's where, you know, this is an opportune audience to kind of think about, you know, as we can kind of integrate these generative AI capabilities and begin to have data that's already kind of ready to have that kind of integration. Now, once we have the platform, then building on top of that becomes all the kind of creative solutions that we can begin to apply to that work. Thinking about the ways that we can kind of go deep in some of this. So if you've heard discussion around horizontal versus vertical AI, this is this is our vertical AI strategy. How can we kind of take the data sets that we have, our, our, you know, our institutional content and begin to inform these kind of deeper applications of AI. Um, and so part of this requires that infrastructure. I want to share one uh, quick example. You've, you know, no, this is kind of the first time I think it's been shared uh, outside of kind of our internal conversations. But one of the things we've been designing is, like I said, we want to encourage and support rapid and widespread experimentation. And so one of the things that we've designed is what we call the My AI Builder. And really its goal here is to help our community design, develop their own kind of AI uh, applications for their for, for their own specific needs. And how it works is that the the you know faculty or staff can come in and they can kind of design uh, their kind of their their AI experience by kind of seeding it with their content, their data, kind of giving it some 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 guidance. And then it create it creates a chat interface that you can kind of begin to present to other people. Through this process, we've identified kind of a couple of key areas, and I'm not going to kind of like demo the technology, but these are kind of the, the core elements of it. One is around kind of helping you know, craft uh, prompts or pre-craft or pre-structure the prompts that come into the system. So again, you know, using the, that, that, uh, that prompt engineering as part of the solution. Another of this is around enabling people to kind of bring their data to this, whether it be documents or, or data sets or whatever the comp, you know, information is that they're bringing in. Uh, the other is around kind of choosing or identifying models. So we've not, I, we've not landed on a single model, but rather right now we're integrating uh, nearly 20 different uh, models across different providers. Um, and all of these are done, like I said, in kind of a, a, a safe, responsible way so that we can begin to innovate and evaluate uh, because some models are good thing for some things and not good for others. Um, and so part of it is that kind of evaluation. And, and we've also developed you know, model comparison tools so people can kind of see or get a sense for what that looks like. And then the last piece is the notion of temperature. And this is kind of a new idea that we've begun to experiment with, is that what we're finding is, is that people, as they interact with AI, there's a certain amount of randomness to its response. And sometimes we want that to be really random. We have people working on you know, tools, technologies that are designed to inspire creative thinking. And so we want it to be more random. But versus a chatbot that's designed to ask a practical question, we don't want that to be very random. We want it to be kind of on the money each time. And so part of it is to think about you know, how do we help the AI kind of respond in a way based on the intended kind of design and use. And so that's where, again, thinking about, you know, dialing in and out um, that AI experience. And that's where this notion of kind of temperature comes from is how random or, or curious uh, might the model be. So across a lot of our work, like I, like I mentioned before, that we've not kind of landed on a single technology. And, and it's a common question, like, so what, what platforms are we leveraging? So this is the kind of complete list, if you're familiar with it. Um, and like I said, there's a lot of variation between them in terms of, in, um, in terms of what uh, the capabilities are. And we're finding that, again, based on the strategy, whether you're designing a chatbot, whether you're designing something to help design a course, whether you're designing something to help help think about creativity or, or access research, right? That certain tools, um, you know, and uh, you know, behave differently uh, and are better fits uh, for others. And so that's a part of our strategy is in the near term that there is so much evolution and change right now inside of these models. It's too early to kind of go all in on any one particular model and rather say, okay, we have a, a range of different uh, possibilities that we can work with.
If you're interested, like here's the actual technology stack as an environment. This is one of those things where, um, you know, for, for those who are, are technically minded, you've probably already taken a screen grab of, of this kind of this. These are the element pieces. Lar a large part of our platform is an AWS based platform, but then we also leverage the large language models that, that exist, whether it be in Azure and OpenAI. This is kind of an abridged or simplified version, but you can kind of get a sense for uh, the structure of, of the overall technology environment. So in terms of, you know, what are some of the other kind of vertical use cases, places where we're putting this to work? One of the ones that I'm most excited about is something we call Syllabot, which is kind of this interactive syllabus notion. It's, you know, so we've all had that experience of taking a class and kind of reading the syllabus. And it's always kind of this two dimensional document. What if we had a conversation with it, right? What if students could ask it questions, help it think creatively about what the, the assignment is, help help think creatively about how that assignment relates to where they're going or what it is they want to work on, right? These kinds of ideas. The other one uh, that I wanted to touch on here is the course design assistant. This is probably one of the biggest areas of investment right now, which is thinking, you know, all of the time and effort that goes into designing, developing courses by our learning designers, by our faculty, right? It's so many different people involved in this. And so the opportunity to help facilitate that process, even if it is just kind of helping to package content or the other part of it is, is to repackage content. So basically we have, you know, course material that gets designed for four credit courses. How can that be repackaged into smaller, shorter, short courses that are non-credit and help facilitate that translation from one way to another? So part of this is, again, the streamlining of this and recognizing how can we kind of transform not only that learning experience, but how work gets done as well so that we can spend more time on facilitating student engagement and supporting you know, student creativity and health uh, than we are kind of worrying about file formats and putting content into systems, right? That we can kind of help facilitate uh, that transformation. So we also have a range of different other, you know, kind of experiments happening now. I mentioned earlier the Possibilities Bot. This is based on uh, research happening in our, our College of Education our Merely Fulton Teachers College, where they're exploring this idea of, you know, helping students kind of expand and think about their creativity. We've also seen some really in interesting work in our writing that I'm going to touch on in a, in a moment that helps us do some of this. Also around Dreamscape Learn, which is our XR our virtual reality environment, having a tutor that can exist both in the virtual environment and in the kind of real world that a student can work with to learn uh, biology in this case, but also expanding into uh, chemistry and astronomy and others. And then also as we design and develop our new uh, medical school, ASU Health, uh, that's where AI kind of plays a role in helping kind of expose access to research across those spaces. Another key area of focus for us has really been around kind of developing transformative partnerships. Um, now, one of these has been with a uh, AWS, which has been a long-term, uh, long-time partner for us. And we've just kind of uh, developed a new relationship with them around our AI Cloud Innovation Center. And so this is a, a location, a physical location, actually at our SkySong uh, location in Scottsdale, where we can bring together community members to think creatively about the ways that AI can change or enhance the, the, communi the community experience. So the places around the institution. And they take on community challenges all the time. So one of them was around graffiti detection, where they attached uh, cameras to the garbage trucks that drive around the streets of, of, of Tempe. And the cameras are able to identify and detect uh, graffiti. And that means that, you know, the, 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 those people who, uh, uh, you know, kind of deal with graffiti in the city don't have to kind of drive around, but the trucks are already doing it, right? So, so again, thinking creatively with our communities, um, and that's where having partners like AWS help us kind of facilitate some of that work. The other big area where we've worked in are working in partnership is with OpenAI. And this is a partnership that's just, you know, a few weeks old at this point, but it's really deeply embedded in this idea of, you know, putting tools into the hands of our faculty, our staff, our students, and really encouraging creativity. Before I talked about kind of vertical AI in terms of going deep, this is more of a horizontal AI strategy, thinking about across disciplines, across and particularly across research, work and learning, uh, and and uh, uh, the, the um, you know, what are the impacts that, that AI can have and doing that in a very kind of mindful way, right? So thinking about kind of one the teaching level, kind of personalizing experiences in the research space, thinking about kind of use inspired research, how can we kind of connect that interdisciplinary opportunity? And then the third being kind of changing of work. And this is the one where 
I personally, I don't feel like enough kind of attention gets paid to, you know, the opportunity to reduce the time spent on particular tasks or to simplify, to create uh, additional, you know, uh, space for, for creativity and exploring new ideas. And so that's where it's been terrific to engage our communities around some of this work. Um, and I'm just going to highlight a couple of them, but a lot of these are kind of taking the, 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 the capability of the technology to help, again, course design is, a, is in content development, key uh, areas of this, helping uh, facilitate kind of feedback, uh, grading, these kinds of things. These are all experiments that are unfolding right now. So part of what we've done is we've engaged our, our entire community to submit and share their ideas. And we've, we've received hundreds of responses. We just, uh, we awarded uh, two weeks ago, our first 105 projects. Um, and actually the only, those that weren't awarded, it wasn't because they were bad ideas. It was because uh, actually there, there were better tools to, to, to kind of solve the problem they were working on. Um, and so the goal here in, it was to bring people together and evaluate these technologies in a range of different spaces. Use inspired research has been one around, again, part of what they're evaluating here is around coding of data, thinking about um, you know, labeling data sets, how can we inspire use informed research? Can it help us kind of evaluate kind of the bias that we see in responses, right? So there are a lot of different ways from a research standpoint, and then also thinking about, you know, work. What, what does it look like to help facilitate, um, you know, a, a business process in a number of ways? One of the projects that I'm most excited about is working with our human resources leadership to, to design a, a AI chat bot that helps a, a manager or a new manager think about talent management. How do I have a difficult conversation? Can I kind of practice some of that language, get examples, do a kind of talent management activity, think about how people fit into the organization, what their, what their potential is. These are challenging conversations to have. So part of the opportunity here is to have, you know, something like AI that can help facilitate some of that thinking. So that's been a lot of the work that we've been engaging with with our, our partners, with OpenAI. And again, the goal there is to kind of reach across the organization, have a lot of different experimentation happening in different spaces. We have a second solicitation that just opened last week. Uh, again, many uh, you know projects being evaluated. We have basically a panel of, of people from across the institution evaluating those proposals. What's different this time is the first time we started with faculty staff kind of seeing what are the experiments there. Now we've included students as part of this expansion. So thinking about you know, the course based uses, thinking about students as entrepreneurs, students as activists, what are the ways that they can kind of put this technology uh, to work to support their particular outcomes? So the last part of this I want to talk about, which is around active exploration. And so this is really, you know, again, where the rubber hits the road, this is where transformation is happening. This is the opportunity to begin to rethink you know, pedagogies in terms of what can this technology enable for us that's different. And one of these things is around helping kind of students get beyond their own kind of personal limits, particularly as we think about uh, writing. And so in our, our writing courses, they've been experimenting with the use of generative AI to help overcome to help overcome their own limits in terms of, and we've all kind of experienced this before, right? I have the ideas in my head and I can't quite get them into the document. I can't quite translate them out. Um, and so part of what they're doing is using uh, generative AI to help students visualize their writing in, in a different way. So this, trans, this moves students away from thinking about writing as a rules-based process, that there are rules of grammar and of spelling and of structure and so on, that it's as if there's kind of like a right way to write and I just need to kind of find it to one that is a visualization process that they can kind of cra begin to craft a narrative and then the AI can, can reflect back at them other ways of thinking about writing uh, in this. And so what we're finding is from the students, and it's really interesting because they all tend to use the same word to describe the challenge they're trying to overcome, their own personal limitation, that they are stuck, that they are stuck in endless revision, that they are stuck kind of with their ideas in their head, they're stuck because they can't quite say what they're trying to say. And with generative AI, they're, they're able to kind of overcome some of these challenges. And that's where the students are feeling like uh, that these, um, that, that this driving is, is around, um, that they can kind of take on riskier things that they're not inhibited uh, by what they can do, that they, they, they feel empowered uh, as writers uh, to do even more. 
So another area that we're that, that faculty are actively exploring is is kind of exploring different choices that they have, and this gets to kind of a personalization, but it does it in kind of a creative way. So there's an interesting challenge that uh, some of our journalism students are taking on, which is if we think about, for example, the American Revolution, we typically imagine it in terms of the portraits from the day, right? So these portraits here of you know founding fathers or or other revolutionaries. But the challenge is that the people, the only people who could have afforded portraits were generally rich white men. And so that's where that has kind of tainted or biased how we think about the American Revolution. And so that's where our faculty and students in our journalism program are trying to get beyond kind of this challenge because it was a pre-selfie era, right? But there were kind of written depictions of people in articles and letters and in in, in, uh, in other forms of writing. And so from that, they can begin to define and, and, and show what is an ordinary revolutionary, the real people that fought the American Revolution that we've never seen before. And that's where they are using generative AI and these, these depictions to begin to explore what they call their kind of hall of, of ordinary revolutionists, people who are a part of this and, and in many ways were the ones who had the most to lose, but now they can begin to see what they look like and understand their history a little bit better and begin to empathize uh, with, with their experiences. They then take these visual depictions and they can kind of take them a step further and begin to animate. In this case, you probably don't hear the uh, audio coming through, but essentially they craft the voice based on their historical background, based on where they would have lived in the States, where they would have migrated from, right? And they can, they can share you know, what their experiences were. And so from a journalism standpoint, a, a, a discipline that has always dealt with the telling of history this is the opportunity for students to not only kind of identify with people who lived at that point that we may not be familiar with, but also begin to connect with uh, people of today. So if you think about the war happening in Ukraine, a very similar you know, situation is happening there that the people who have the most to, most to lose are not the ones that we see on the news. And to make sure that we're also in our experience telling their story as well. Another really great example that I wanted to share today is around you know how we can help accelerate learning, particularly around the kind of discussion of ideas. And there's fascinating work happening right now in uh, in our design school, particularly around architecture. And that's where you know if you learn architecture, there's there's definitely a significant maturing that happens from your first year to your to your to your last year. And so part of it is is that how can we help students across that uh, or, or participating in that path that that have deeper conversations earlier in the process and develop a, a, a deeper spatial awareness around their own uh, capabilities. So one of the things they've developed is this new instructional approach where they can use AI to help a student kind of visualize design. And one of the things they can do is kind of start with small elements of a building design and then expand it out incrementally. So in this case, the student started with a window, went to a door, went to an entryway, went to a kind of full facade, right? So you can kind of see how they expanded out in their thinking and thinking about kind of the small details that happened throughout that process. Once they kind of do that, uh, then they can expand that into thinking about the entire structure and the context in which this structure exists, right? So beginning to think about how is the building situated? How is it situated uh, with people in different environments, right? So they can begin to visualize their work in a different way. And so faculty reporting, what this does is it helps students develop a deeper understanding about their own kind of spatial ability and begin to apply this to their work. It also creates the opportunity for upper and lower division students to engage in discussion and they get there much faster because they have this kind of common area to work from. So using kind of a set of, of AI skills, applying this in a new way, you can kind of accelerate a conversation that would otherwise take months to unfold. And now they're doing them in a series of short workshops and using generative AI helps them kind of facilitate that. So this is an interesting space where the AI is not only helping support the creativity, but it's also helping support the social connection uh, between students inside of those courses. The last one I wanted to talk about, and this is probably one of my favorites, is I, I met this student and, and she had uh, taken a workshop uh, on generative AI. And part of it was around kind of, a, you know, a she self-applied that technology to an interesting design problem. And so one of the things uh, that she did was she was taking on the, the challenge of, 
of uh, Coral Death in uh, Hawaii. And so she was part of a design studio that, that went to Hawaii and was, was studying this problem and designing solutions to help take on, you know, how can we help address this or help mitigate kind of the, the places where humans have an impact on, on, that, on that system. And so one of the uh, things she did was she used generative AI as a way to help inform her designs, but also so that she could share her ideas with other people in the class. And so, or, or I'm sorry, as part of that design studio. So in this case, you know, she imagined a world that had, um, you know, electric buoys that could charge electric boats, right? So that it didn't put as much kind of contaminant into the water that could affect the coral. Or there was another example here where she kind of imagined a world uh, where there's an underwater drone, and this is like a smart anchor that you control uh, with your smartphone. A really compelling idea. But the one that just really got me, uh, which was is this one, which is um, you know, which honestly looks kind of like an octopus torture device. That's not at all what it is. Uh, but it, it's this idea that a boat anchor could work like an octopus, that it could have tentacles and arms and suckers, and it could grab onto things without destroying them. Um, and kind of a biomimicry uh, style design. And what's compelling about this is that, you know, as she's a part of this design studio, she's using this technology to visualize something that doesn't exist in the world. This isn't something where you could kind of do a Google search and say, oh, show me a boat anchor that looks like an octopus, right? She had to manifest this idea and in such a way that to explain it to somebody else in a compelling way. And so this is where, again, using the AI, it, it, it enabled her creativity, but also made it so that she can kind of express her idea. Even something is kind of, you know, kind of hard to explain as, as this, uh, as what, like I said, the tentacle anchor or what she calls the huggy. So this is another, you know, just a terrific example where our students are being creative. They're using the technology is at hand to help drive and support uh, their learning. So with that, you know, like I said, I've, I've explained or talked through our, our enterprise AI strategy unfolding here at, at ASU. As you can see, there are lots of different activities happening in different spaces, some large, some small, all of them focused on kind of how do we help support successful outcomes for our, for our students, our faculty, staff. But the other part of it is to recognize that we are really very much kind of on a journey at this point, right? That we are looking ahead and saying, okay, how do we continue to innovate? But also how do we become active contributors to defining what this technology looks like. So as it grows and takes root in education to make sure that, that we're helping influence that so that it, it helps uh, you know, recognize the, the needs of our particular learners. And so that's where, like I said, it, it's, not a, it's, it's not an outcome. Innovation is not a destination that we reach, but rather it's kind of that, that journey that we're on. So thinking about you know, what the possibilities of what that one size fits one uh, experience can be. Well, I thank you very much for your time today. Um, I'm going to pause there and welcome Bart back up. Like I said, here is our, our AI website at ASU, ASU.edu. It has more information on everything I talked about today and other stories and activities. This is very much a living space where we communicate with our community. Um, and then also has my contact information. I'd love to hear more about what you're working on or places where we can kind of share and, and work together. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kyle. Uh, we do have one, I think, just a clarifying question that came in. Uh, did you actually say you have 105 projects going on in this AI space when you were talking about the number of, of different projects taking place at ASU? Uh, so, uh, well, so the, the, we have 105 projects happening uh, with our as part of our open AI collaboration. Um, and those are the ones happening now. And then, like I said, the, the second solicitation just opened. So we'll have a number more, you know, in terms of total number of initiatives, I don't have the number in front of me, but they, they're unfolding um, ac across a range of different spaces. Um, and so there are, um, you know, many different people involved in those projects, both from a kind of as a participant, as a kind of PI, although I use that kind of as a, ca as a casual term, uh, because it really is to encourage experimentation at this point. So we don't want to create too much of a, a, of a barrier to entry so that if somebody has a creative idea, so for example, it could be like, a, I was just actually talking with somebody yesterday who has a work team that has to develop a lot of custom uh, communications for uh, residence halls. And so part of it is just to, that they can, inf they can use generative AI, infuse their information into it so it's providing contextually correct information, but they can adjust its tone based on the message they're trying to send. Something that would have historically have taken them a lot of time to craft individual messages for each person, 
now can be facilitated much faster. So, so part of it is to encourage a range of different projects like that across different groups, focusing again on you know changing work, supporting teaching and learning, um, and, and advancing particularly use-inspired research. Great, thank you. So by all means, if people have questions, uh, you can use the chat and we'll, we'll try and get questions to Kyle. And as people are thinking about questions, uh, there was something I wanted to, to go back to something you said earlier. You had your framework, right? Sort of the four pillars of the framework. Uh, and you had culture and you had culture first, which I think is, is important, right? For people that uh, I know a lot of people in Unison have gone through uh, you know, more associates, uh, uh, leadership development. And one of the sayings that they use all the time is, you know, culture eats strategy for breakfast, uh, which I find to be true most of the time. So I was just wondering if you could share on the culture front, you know, what what has worked and what hasn't worked in terms of trying to, to engage a culture as big uh, as you have there at Arizona State University? Yeah, you know, absolutely. And that's where it really is. You know, it was a f the first part of our strategy. It's, it's the part we've been working at this the longest. And it's and it's arguably one of the most critical pieces of it is that if we want to make this, you know, well, AI is going to be a part of our students future for sure. And part of this is also a, to make it a part of how we operate inside of higher education to help help us support our students, support their outcomes, help make us more efficient as organizations, right? So there's a lot of opportunity to change in there. And that's why culture is so critical to this work. And so the other part of it is, is that, that the role that AI has, that, that there's a lot of misunderstanding about it. And, and it, part of it is, is that when, sometimes when I hear the concerns, they're not necessarily like, there are concerns for sure, but sometimes they're not the ones that, that, that people feel like. Um, and so part of it is that's why education is so critical here is creating that basic sense of AI literacy. We started with our faculty. We've expanded that into all of our staff that's just recently launched here. Um, and then we're all, we also have groups that are working to help define that for our students and embedding that in their into their courses. And that's the part is to is through one education two building community, right? Getting people together, talking about what they're trying to do, what they've experienced, what's worked well for them, what hasn't worked well for them. Um, as an institution, we like to celebrate those ex those successes, some of the things I shared today, right? To celebrate, these are these are faculty and students who are innovating, they're innovating of their own design. It's very exciting to see, and, and we want to kind of champion that uh, as much as we can. Uh, and then third is, is to find practical ways for people to be a part of the change. And that's where, you know, again, that horizontal AI strategy where we can begin to apply AI across a lot of different spaces. It's the opportunity to engage a lot of people in being part of that process. Kind of, It's kind of like the citizen scientist approach, right? So it's the same kind of like, let's engage, you know, individual work teams, you know, people who don't necessarily typically engage in teaching or research and engage them in kind of this, Kind of friendly research process and that has gone a long way to just generating excitement in the community and so the way we launched that um is in it is an idea definitely worth borrowing which was we introduced it as a challenge so it was a friendly kind of notion of hey you know what there's a you know we're looking for innovators we're looking for people with big ideas that we want to support and enable um and so we put that out as a challenge and like i said we've had you know so many people as part of that um, and, and participate. And so again, creating those pathways for people to be a part of the change. Great. Uh, so it was great to, to also see that uh, both ethics and privacy came up as those are critical pieces, not, not just in generative AI, but AI in general before generative AI hit. So we had a question uh, from a viewer. Can you talk more about how you were using your ethics committee, uh, maybe with an example? Yeah, absolutely. So the in, in, you're exactly right. Ethics has always been a part of our work. And that's where, like I said, we have at ASU our principled innovation framework that we use kind of as an institution to help guide in some of these spaces. But at the same time, it was necessary to, as we're working on the technology design, to involve uh, ethicists more to kind of like a, at, a, at a more granular level, because there were some like there were decisions that need to be made. And let's talk about and explore what some of the different applications are. And so one of the the um, uh, you know, one of the areas uh, where that's come to, to play substantially is in our evaluation framework. So part of what part of one of the first things we had to create was as we're developing tools that are providing kind of responses and creative ideas. How do we evaluate those responses to assure or to evaluate the level of, of bias that are in them? Because you can't 
can't get rid of the bias, no matter what anybody may tell you, it can't, you know, it will always be biased in some degree, but evaluating what is, you know, what is the source, uh, what is the source or nature of that bias? To what degree um, does it provide errant responses, right? So the ability to kind of have a way to evaluate tools became kind of job one of that group to say, okay, let's work together to figure out, you know, as, as technologists, as we're developing these tools, have a framework to better understand um, you know, what to, how to evaluate, you know, the technology. Great. Thank you. We have another question here. How are you allowing folks to be innovative with all these new tools while still keeping your campus secure and individual information secure? Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, that's critically important. And that's where, to some degree, why it took us some time to put tools into people's hands. Because so to start with, a lot of it was, cultural development in working with kind of free tools, but to do it in kind of like a casual way, right? So that we're not necessarily, um, you, know, you know, handing any data over or just really kind of people experimenting, you know, early stage. That was a big part of our relationship and partnership with OpenAI was that with their ChatGPT enterprise product, it created the space uh, for kind of that privacy security so that we could have those kinds of, of interactions and have a tool set that people could use that integrates into our enterprise. And then the second piece of it is our, our uh, the design of our, our AI uh, platform, which again, is that blending of kind of generative AI capability, our institutional content. Um, and, and that's where to do that in a, a secure way so that it, because the language model providers that we're working with are people that we already have kind of contractual uh, agreements with to safeguard our data. Um, and because we have our data environment on the other side that we can begin to kind of bring those together. And I mentioned it earlier, and it's worth you mentioning again, that's one of the kind of neat spaces that Unison occupies in this, which is that opportunity to kind of stage data to begin to blend it into that, that uh, into, in, into the kind of generative uh, model. So once that, in, you know, as that, that environment continues to mature, uh, that we can integrate, you know, these different large language models together, you know, having that data ready to go is a critical part of, of finding success early. Yeah, certainly, you know, quality data is important. It's the foundation for all of this. And if you don't have quality data, it makes it, uh, you know, difficult to get high quality results here. So we probably have time for one more question for the audience. If someone has a question, I just have one short question here. Uh, I want to go back to temperature. So as you were talking about this notion of temperature, it reminded me of uh, GPS, right? Sometimes you want to get from point A to B as quickly as possible. Sometimes you want to hit the scenic route, right? And kind of, you know, have it record. How did you come up with that? Because I don't think I've seen anything quite like that notion uh, that, that, you know, you can sort of try and turn the knobs a little bit to, to get maybe the less direct answer. No, and well, you know, based on the startup uh, or the setup of the question, Bart, I thought you were going to ask me about Chile, but okay, we'll talk about AI <laughs> instead. The uh, so the uh, so that is a new new notion that part of it is as we've engaged with our community and people who are experimenting, there is that kind of uh, that that strata, if you will, of of how to think about the responses from AI, and so I describe it this way: is that that you know there are kind of three ish. Uh, you know, genres of interaction. There's one is AI as a calculator, right? That it gives the right answer each time. AI as a coach, where the intent is that it's moving you towards the right answer, but not giving you the answer. Um, and the, the third is as a creative, right? That it's kind of just giving you ideas. And at AI as it exists today, on the calculator end, it's not so great, right? Like it, there, it has room to grow and improve. And actually there are some other AI technologies. We can look at machine learning. Other things, they actually do that much better, right? So there are tools that exist in the generative AI space. You know, having a right answer every time, all the time is, is a tall order. In the middle space, that's definitely um, improving substantially. We have a lot of work happening there. We've been working with closely with Google, their DeepMind products, thinking about what tutoring looks like for writing and biology in a number of spaces. So I think that one's evolving. And then the other end, which is on the creative end. And so it's just like inspiring new creativity. Part of it is like, what is the word to describe those differences? Because as you describe them, like, yeah, I kind of get that, right? And, and so part of it is the, uh, to what degree is the response curious or to, to what degree is the response uh, unexpected right and in some cases you want that you want the like you said the scenic route right and sometimes i want i just want the answer right and that's and so part of it is to say to what degree is this what i have in mind um and part of it is in, and it's part of experimenting in, in different applications of the AI, kind of providing a tool that helps helps take something which is actually fairly technical and helps the user kind of dial it you know, dial it in and out based on their particular application. 
Yeah, that, that's interesting. The three different descriptions. I I was teaching a class at, at Penn State in spring of 2022, and we had a lot of conversations about ChatGPT at the time because it was new and emerging. And I remember asking my students about different use cases, and the number one use case by far was road trip planning. Now again, mm -hmm. college students, right? But that's I think one of those curiosity things is, hey, we're we're going to a Big Ten football game somewhere, right? You know, where do we stop to get the best pizza? Where's the best hotel? Those kind of things. So I think that's interesting. Uh, we don't see any more questions and we're at the top of the hour here. So I want to thank you, Kyle, for spending some time with us today. Always great to, to reconnect and hear what great work's going on at Arizona State. So we appreciate it. And we have a 15 minute break now and we will start back up here at 1215 Central with our first series of concurrent sessions. Thank you, everyone. Hope you have a great summit.